Hello, this is Larry Stoll from Pace Turf, and today I want to talk about some winter diseases that we're seeing on bent grass greens, and we're seeing it in a few locations, so I thought it'd be worth talking about. That good looking sample on the right is from a nursery area at a golf course that's having a little bit of a problem. So this middle sample is from a medium sort of uh, severity of the disease, and then we'll see on this left sample just coming in that it's pretty severe. I mean, the turf is uh, thinned pretty heavily, and this is showing up after the summer uh, period and going into the winter. If we look at the washed samples and look at the roots, you can see the density in the thatch layer is very dense on the, uh, on the nursery. Not surprising, it's not trafficked or anything. Uh, and then this middle sample, you can see the root density is less. And then on the left, you can see that's really struggling. There's just uh, not a lot of roots and there's, of course, not a lot of top growth because the roots are bad. So what we wanted to do is take a look at these samples and you can see the, cup, the cup cutters have been cut in half. Half of it went to the lab for soil analysis, and this is the half we looked at for disease diagnoses. And you can see there's some pretty severe root damage on the uh, severely affected area, and it's intermediate in the middle one. So let's take a look at what we see um, under the microscope. So we can try to identify what might be going on with the roots. There was no foliar diseases associated with these samples. And as what we can see when we look at these uh, roots is, is something that we've had a little bit of uh, trouble getting a consistent ID, uh, the university people say this is a, might be takeoff patch, might be summer patch. Uh, we haven't done the DNA work on it, so we're not perfectly sure, but the symptoms are consistent with summer patch with these growth cessation structures, those dark uh, suburized cells, in addition to those ectotrophic hyphae that run along the surface of the root. So there's really, um, this puts it into the basically the ascomycetes that would be in a group that would be, include take-all patch and summer patch. So the management is the same uh, regardless of those two diseases. And this is a close-up of the uh, growth cessation structures and that's what, how the fungus survives over the winter in adverse conditions. And the dark little strand that you see is the ectotrophic hyphae, which sometimes you'll hear people talk about dark ectotrophic hyphae. So we're pretty sure that was the disease. Uh, Cleary's 3336 or thiophanate methyl and QI fungicide zoxystrobin did a good job of controlling it. And so now let's take a look at the, uh, the soils anyway because we weren't sure what was going to be the, uh, the source of the problem. So we looked at both the sufficiency levels of available nutrients and the new minimum levels for sustainable nutrition. And the uh, major cations that, that uh, we're going to talk about were extracted with Nelic 3 and you'll see that it's a little bit on the calcareous side and a standard 1 to 2 uh, dilution for, for pH and also, uh, well, I guess it's 1 to 1 for pH and 1 to 2 uh, uh, soil to water for the electrical conductivity. So this is the uh, sufficiency levels of 750 parts per million for calcium. We can see that there's plenty of calcium in the system from the, from the standard LAN requirements and also even if you look at the really the low levels and the new uh, minimal nutrition, uh, 330 parts per million, we've got plenty of uh, calcium. Same goes for magnesium, although we're seeing an increase uh, in the levels as you go from good to medium to poor, that's where the location on the bottom, uh, it really shows that there's plenty of nutrition out there and it's not excessive uh, as far as magnesium is concerned. And sodium, even though we're seeing a relationship between uh, the good, medium, and poor, it's still below 110 parts per million. Uh, so we're not seeing uh, what we consider to be stressful conditions. And it's probably just reflecting the age of these, uh, these root zones. Now if we look at uh, nitrate nitrogen, there was hardly any nitrate nitrogen, but we do see there's quite a bit of ammonium nitrogen, in, in particular in the pore side. That probably indicates that there's some decomposition going on and nitrification is not working too well, but still not enough that we would be really concerned about as far as actually causing the damage that we're seeing. And we got a good response from the fungicide. But this just goes to show that you have to look at the soil sometime just to sort out what might be happening. But we don't think there's a problem here with uh, nitrogen and there's adequate nitrogen. We'd like to see uh, somewhere around five parts per million. Well, when we look at potassium, we see that we have plenty of potassium. Even the good uh, performing area has less potassium. So potassium deficiency is not a problem and we don't seem to have an excess because we know we can tolerate up to 110 parts per million uh, with no problems. Uh, when we look at easily extractable phosphorus, this would be Melic 3 extractable phosphorus. We have an abundance of phosphorus, really too much phosphorus. And even the Olsen phosphorus, not shown here, but uh, was up at about uh, 28 parts per million when we only need about six. So no problem with the phosphorus deficiencies. Uh, pH was in a reasonable range from 7 to 7.7 .7 in, the, in the intermediate, uh, the medium sample had the highest pH. Uh, there was a relationship with sulfur, but those levels are still low. So it's not an excess of sulfur and it's not a deficiency of sulfur. So there's no problem with sulfur uh, in the system. Looks good. Organic matter is less than 1.5%, so 
that looks great. Uh, total salinity is way less than uh, four decisiemens per meter, so we, we're under one. So there's no problem with salts, even though we're seeing a little sulfur and chloride, it's not, not an issue. In fact, if you look at chloride levels, we can tolerate up to about four, 400 parts per million without a problem, or 800 parts per million with a combination of chloride and sulfur for bent grasses. So we're just way below those levels. So we're not seeing any stresses from salts or sulfur or chloride, anything like that. Iron levels are adequate. Uh, even the good performing area has uh, down around 50 parts per million when we t usually target around 100 parts per million iron and about 30 parts per million manganese on the right side. So we're really not seeing a problem. And the good, uh, the poor performing area had the highest manganese levels. Uh, we almost have uh, the 110 part per million that we'd, we'd like to see in the poor area for suppression of takeoff patch. We could move manganese levels up a little bit and uh, the iron and manganese ratios are, are okay. There's a little bit of extra uh, uh, manganese in the system, but it's uh, iron in the system compared to manganese. So overall, we didn't see anything in the soils that would give us a, a suggestion that there would be a problem uh, related to stress. In fact, uh, there was lower nutrition in the nursery area, and that's probably because it was younger and hasn't uh, accumulated that much nutrition. So these, uh, these samples that you're seeing here are related to the intensity of the uh, summer patch on the bent grass roots and as you can see it pretty well chewed up the uh, chewed up the roots and this probably took place during the summertime when soil temperatures were above 65 but once the uh, turf got into the winter you're starting to see some stress due to cold weather on the bent grasses that resulted in this type of a decline showing up uh, in the winter. Take a look at the associated information with this video and I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you next time.